The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tyson, my partner, Malik Hill. We've had some technical issues today, and it's uh, been wild, but uh, I think we worked through it, and hopefully it'll fix it, and we don't have to take any more pauses. But anyway, <laughs> we are at the end of March Madness, basically. We are to our Final Four. It's March 29th, and the Final Four will be played on Saturday, leading up to Monday's Final Championship. And the wild thing is we have a 3-4 and four chance of getting a, na- a national champion that has never been a national champion. And we're also in the first year ever that we have no number one seeds. No number one seeds made it to the Elite Eight, uh, which I don't think ever happens. And, okay, I think we're good. <laughs> and um, it's kind of wild. Uh, You're talking about the Final Four, no number one seeds for the first time ever. Yes. Um, so we have San Diego State in the Final Four facing off against Florida Atlantic, the matchup everybody looked out for. And then we have Miami and UConn on the other side. And it seems like UConn has been the most dominant team out of everybody. But we are going to get either the Aztecs or the Owls in the national championship game. What do you think about that one? As much as I say I support San Diego State, I never could have guessed this in a million years. I, they're a team I liked, but, yeah, I, I never could have guessed it. Mm-hmm. And then Florida Atlantic, I mean, they were a great regular season team. And outside of that, I don't, I don't think many people had them going super far outside of FAU fans and the players in that locker room and, and Dusty May. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, hats off to FAU. They Every time it seemed like a team was going to beat them, they punched back and figured out a way to win. And San Diego State might be the best defensive team that's played in this tournament because they've, they've just figured out ways. They've just they've figured out ways how to win and keeping guys from having – like huge scoring bursts and getting hot. So, yeah, San Diego State and FAU. I I don't know. It's it's a weird outlier. Mm. They're both good teams, but like we said, nobody could have predicted this. Yeah, and I think the wild thing is just like they're kind of they're not necessarily two different teams, but Florida Atlantic is, I would say, much better offensively, and San Diego State just stops people with their defense. Um. But I think the key that FAU has had is their size. And, like, they have uh, that big seven-footer in the middle uh, that's been playing super well. And they just – they actually look really good. Now, I guess people are a little surprised, but at the same time, like, you go back and think, like, this team was a top 25 team at one point during the season. Um they're a 31 team on the season. We've seen that before where teams do that, especially with like uh, Oral Roberts in the past. But this time, like to make it all the way to the final four for a team like that is crazy. Um, and then San Diego State being able to knock off Alabama, the number one overall seed in the entire tournament. Uh, they've surprised me every way uh, of the tournament. I thought they were going to lose first round. I thought they had a really good chance to just because they were kind of stumbling into the tournament. They really they haven't shot and shot well right. in this tournament, especially Brandon Miller. Yeah. And then on the other side, Miami and UConn, two of kind of the top offenses the last couple of weeks. Miami really turned it on late in that game. Um and then UConn, like Gonzaga has a thriller with UCLA to get in. 
And then in, in the Sweet 16, uh, one of the honestly one of the best games of the tournament, but nobody probably really saw it because it was late at night. Yeah. Um, and then UConn just smacks Gonzaga. They were up almost by forty at one point. They won by thirty, and I I don't know. They're just on a roll. Um, do you think that Miami has a chance against UConn or do like? I don't know. I'm I'm starting to get nervous that UConn's just on a roll. And it's going to be one of those weird, like, nobody talks about UConn all season, and then they just roll to a, a championship. I think UConn is on a roll, and I would, honestly, I would take them in this matchup. Mm-hmm. But Miami, every time I think they're out of the game, they go on, like, a 16-2 scoring run, and they just take control. It's like They've done it at least two games in this tournament where it seems like they, do, they really don't have much left. They're kind of out of gas. And then Isaiah Wong and Nigel Peck just stopped missing shots. Mm-hmm. And they just they just go on a warpath. They just go on a run. They just go on a run where it seems like they're unstoppable scoring. And I, I don't know if they can replicate it for two more games. It seems like they can because mm-hmm. they've done it over and over. But – I, I don't know what Jim Laranega tells them in huddles. I don't know what the, their halftime speech is. Whenever it's time to light up, they do it. Yeah. And, yeah, UConn has sustained it for, like, full games. Miami does it in almost every second half. So these are two teams that can score. Both teams can defend, but they're not, like, high-level defensive teams. Mm-hmm. It should be a great matchup. Yeah. What is your prediction, do you think, then, for the final at this point? I will go with UConn, and on the other side, I think. You know what? You know what? I think I'm going to go FAU. I think their wild ride just keeps going for some reason. San Diego State, great defensive team, Mm -hmm. offensive limitations. They have a few players that can get buckets, but their consistent half court offense isn't very good. I'm I'm just gonna go FAU. I'm kind Florida of Florida Atlantic versus UConn in the championship. I'm kind of in the same boat. Part of it is one for our family bracket that would be the most exciting because then it comes down to the two people. Um if FAU loses, we will know who our winner is uh after the UConn game. Because if FAU loses and uh UConn loses then we will know who wins our family bracket. But if FAU wins, then we could have uh, a number of different people, which would be cool. So, But I also think like FAU has a really good chance, um, yeah, they, which is wild to say. They have like three or four guys that can all heat up and hit big shots when they need them. And they do, they've done it consistently for the most part. Like I thought Kansas State had, take, had taken control of that game. Mm-hmm. And FAU just punches back every time. Yeah. So, yeah. I I have a question before we move on. Okay. Do you think this is good for the NCAA tournament in college basketball? Or do you think this is kind of a sign of things that are kind of getting worse in college basketball? The fact that there are no blue bloods, all the top seeds just didn't show up. And this random assortment of teams have just gotten hot and they're all here. I think, I mean, I'm probably in the minority, but I've said it multiple times. I love this. Um, now, we'll have to see from a rating standpoint what's actually going to happen um, because I would assume there may not be as many people watching because the upsets and stuff are fun for a while. But when you get down to the final four and stuff, usually people want to see really good teams. Um, not to say that these aren't good teams, but again, people forget that the tournament is not set up for the best college team to win every year. Um, if that was the case, you know, we would have a lot more, you know, Zion Williamson, RJ Barrett, Cam Reddish would have won. Um, I would say they were one of the best teams that season. Um, but that's not what this is. This yeah. is a best of one. The tournament, good. the tournament would be like 10 or 12 teams. Right. If that's what they wanted to base it off. Yeah. And, and they would, you would have to do like, 10 to 12 teams play best of threes and it just wouldn't be the same excitement. So for me, I love it because I hate seeing the same teams every year. 
Um, and I know you get like certain consistencies, of course, with those top teams. But now I, I just feel like in this era, the with the transfer transfer portal being as big as it is, these smaller schools can get big name, somewhat big name guys from higher schools that aren't getting the time and can make these, you know, older teams better. Um, so I think that like my biggest thing is um, with the transfer portal and the combination of NIL, because I think NIL is keeping a lot of people around because it's incentivizing again, some of those smaller schools, they can pay some of their players and they don't need, like they're not pushing for their draft stock to move up because they have very low, if at all, any draft stock. So they can make money in college, stay longer maybe have some breakout season and maybe make it to the next level. Um, and even with some of the bigger schools, just NIL keeping you around. Like I, w- I always think of a guy like Hunter Dickinson, like the rumors are that he's coming back again. We don't know for sure yet, but his incentive is his draft stock has tanked in my opinion from what it was a couple years ago. Um, but he can still make tons of money through NIL. So why wouldn't he just chain or stay maybe increase that draft stock back up and make that Michigan team good again instead of, you know, if he leaves, who knows what's going to happen with the program. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, yeah. Do you like it or do you want the big names? Um, I'm all for it. I am definitely a fan of parody in college sports overall. And, even though it is strange seeing this happen, it is awesome seeing this happen at the same time. Because yeah. you have really good t- – UConn is a really good team. Mm-hmm. They finished top three in the Big East. Miami won the ACC regular season. On the other side, San Diego State, this is the first time a Mountain West team has made the Final Four. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. FAU, out of nowhere, incredible season. Dusty May became one of the best coaches in college basketball. Right. They show everybody that they're a real team. To me, that's a good balance of a Final Four. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be North Carolina. It doesn't have to be Duke. It doesn't have to be Kansas. There can be switched up things. And because of that, and because of that I enjoy it. I, I also, yes, I'm in favor of it. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. Um, one final, final thing before we actually move on. We, I have to talk about the MSU game. Um, one of the best tournament games – it's still the only game to go into overtime this tournament, correct? Yeah. Honestly, one of the best I've seen ever, honestly. Yeah. Marquise Noel was crazy. Um, Michigan State played really good defense. Uh, I hate that A.J. Hoggard had a really good game. But what? how can you? <laughs> you know, I, I'm a hater. I understand you. There's a difference between being annoyed by inconsistency and just not wanting someone to play with yeah. him. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Um, he was dominating. Yeah, he, he played really well. Um, Tyson Walker played okay. I think that was kind of the biggest disappointment. Um, but I just – it's weird because, you know, I'm I'm tic- typically on the MSU side and I try to, you know, spin it to how good they are. And they're a very good team. But man, some of the MSU fans during that game were wilding. I, they, they played good, but they did not play good enough. They played really good defense at times, but also in the end, they gave up threes. They could never fully adjust. Right, Marquise Noel basically let them in the game by shooting those crazy deep threes. Yes, he's been known to hit some, but I feel like he got a little bit off kilter there towards the end and you know people were talking about well where did Maddie Sissoko go why does it matter Maddie Sissoko is not a good player I'm sorry to say he's athletic he's got the body type but this is what we've been talking about all season long Michigan State is full of guys that are about 6'9 basically forwards that are playing power forward and center positions even their freshmen are not that big. The only one that's big is Cooper. He's 6'10, I believe. But like people don't realize Kohler is also 6'9. So like 
he's not going to help you a ton, and he's slow at 6'9". So that is Michigan State's problem. They're small, even though Kansas State isn't the biggest team either, but they like their bigs are long and lanky. Um, and I don't know. It just, it, like, the other thing that's weird is, like, what were we doing on defense that, you know, everybody's crying out, like, Marquise Noel is this, he's that. He's the best player on the planet. Okay, we're getting a little crazy. Um, but Jaden Akins should have been on him at all times. And they had him occasionally, somewhat during uh, the end of the game, but they also switched off of him almost all the time. And that led to open threes. They're just doing too many, too much switching, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I just needed to get it off my chest. They they played good, but I I just don't think they played well enough to win that game. Um, and I'm not gonna like I'm super critical on the Pistons all the time, and they're my team. I'm super critical on the Lions, but I love them. Michigan State. I'm just going to be critical. I'm going to stay to what I am. Oh, boy. Okay, moving on. Um, the NBA has gotten pretty wild, um, especially the Western Conference, if anything. Within the last week, we talked about it a little bit last week, that the West was already kind of crazy. OKC was, they, what, they were up in the sixth or seventh seed at the time. They were at seven, I think. And... They're basically what are I don't even know where they're they're out of the playoffs right now, right? They're in the tenth the tenth spot. Yeah. So that just goes to show, and we've said it a couple of times, like every team is within two to three spots. But Dallas is sitting right outside the play ins right now. Yeah. Uh because they lost to Charlotte. The Charlotte Hornets have beaten Dallas and yeah, they, they beat, beat them two, t- two yeah, times in two a times and they beat OKC all to basically knock them down in the playoff standings. So now my Pelicans are back in the playoffs. The Lakers are back in the playoffs. And now Lakers fans everywhere are going crazy because LeBron is back. Are the Lakers making a run, Malik? No. <laughs> okay, good. But now the Timberwolves are jockeying to make it to that sixth spot and not even have to be in the play-in game. They're right behind the Warriors at 39 and 37. The only teams that have clinched uh, so far are Denver and Memphis. But even Memphis could get knocked out of the two spot if Sacramento goes crazy at the end of the season here. Um, So right now we have Denver, Memphis, Sacramento, Phoenix, uh, Clippers, Golden State, Minnesota, New Orleans, Lakers, Thunder, and then the Mavericks, Jazz and Blazers, which I think the Blazers have finally kicked the can. I think they're sitting Damian Lillard the last few weeks uh, or the last couple games of the season. Utah technically, I think, still has a chance, um, but it's very slim, and Dallas would have to keep losing. And, yeah, everybody is just mashed together from fourth to basically 12th, to be honest. Um. Phoenix has gotten Kevin Durant back. The Clippers, I believe we mentioned it last week, that Paul George is going to be out uh, for a little bit. And then Golden State, there's still no word on Andrew Wiggins, which would be a big boost to them if they can make it into the playoffs. And then Minnesota just got Carl Anthony Towns back. The Pelicans still don't really have word on Zion. The Lakers, like I said, they got LeBron back. And then OKC, I'm pretty sure they're all healthy. And I believe Dallas is healthy um, for the most part. I know that uh, Shea didn't play in the game yesterday against the Hornets. But uh, they got 30 points from three different players. <laughs> uh, from Josh, uh, Josh, bleh, Josh Giddy, Isaiah Joe, and uh, Jalen Williams. Which is crazy. Um, no. Now try. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. This is obnoxious. I'm sorry for all the listeners. Um, again, technical difficulties, we'll have to figure them out next week. Um, 
I know you're a big OKC guy. Do you think that they're going to make it in? Or, I mean, I know you want them to make it in. So they got the Pistons next, which is a win. (laughs) Uh, They go to Indiana Friday. Mm -hmm. That could easily be a win. Tyrese Halliburton hasn't played in a few weeks, I think. But then their final week of the season. Uh, Suns, Warriors, Jazz, Grizzlies. (laughs) All playoff teams. Yeah, not a... Not ideal. Mm-hmm. Them going two and two is probably like the best thing that could happen. Yeah. Really tough. But to be honest, if you look at the Mavericks schedule, the Mavericks, they're playing uh, the 76ers tonight. And then they have the Heat, Hawks, Kings, Bulls, and Spurs, which Bulls and Spurs, sure. But the they, rest better, of those, they better hope they can go three and two. The rest of those teams are fighting for playoff spots. Yeah. So the Mavericks do not have an easy schedule. Uh, the Lakers. Have the Bulls. They just lost to the Bulls at home. And they now got, they got the Bulls again in Chicago. Yep. Pat Bev is talking all that trash. Yep. I love it. But LeBron's probably going to play a full game tonight Yeah. for them. And then they have the Timberwolves. In play. Minnesota. In the Tim- they're playing pretty solid right now Yep. with Cat back. Then they have the Rockets, Jazz, Clippers, Suns, Jazz. For so them, the, that's not easy. Like, for like, no, all these teams, we just, don't know what's going to happen. And just thinking about that, I have to look at the Jazz schedule. The Jazz play the Spurs tonight because the Jazz do have a chance. Jazz play the Spurs tonight. Then they play the Celtics, Nets, Lakers, Thunder, Nuggets, Lakers. They also have a crazy schedule. You're going to predict the Jazz just went out? I don't think so. <laughs> but, like, if the Jazz take both of those Laker games. That would be, oh, my God. I want that more than anything now. They might sneak I want them in. to lose to the Bulls twice and lose to the Jazz twice. Like, there's a lot of crazy scenarios on what could happen. Pelicans are playing the Nuggets tonight. That's going to be a good game. They play the Clippers, Kings, Grizzlies, Knicks, and Timberwolves. Ugh, that's rough. How oh. much hope do you have for the Pelicans at this point? <sighs> after looking at that Very schedule. Very little, I assume. After looking at that schedule, yeah. that's tough. Um, But, yeah, it, it's... It's cool because not only, you know, is it this close of a standing, but all these teams are going to play each other. Um, So we're going to get, like, a lot of playoff intensity games before the playoffs start and before the playing tournament starts. Um, Because, again, like, the Bulls are also jockeying for a playing tournament. And, yeah, it's it's wild. Yeah, I honestly... We both want the Lakers out. That's no surprise. Mm-hmm. Get them out of here. Yeah. But if it stood at three versus six, Sacramento versus Golden State, that's must see. Yeah. First round stuff right there. Yeah. People have been talking about that a lot because Sacramento is the best offense in the league this year. And offensive efficiency is the highest it's ever been since, I don't know, the 60s with Wilt Chamberlain, Chamberlain when he averaged 50 a game. And Golden State is obviously Golden State, but they're the worst road team in the league. Yeah, and without Andrew Wiggins, they're just not complete. And Sacramento... They'll they'll show moments of being the Warriors, but that's it. Sacramento would get their first playoff game, and it would be at home since 2006. But they're also the worst defensive team in the league. So there's a lot of crazy matchups. Golden State, probably one of the, you know most veteran teams of no, that know how to win Sacramento basically new to this yeah. Gary Payton the second is supposed to be back yeah in a game or two which does he just jump right back into what it was last year right I, I'm, I don't know mm-hmm. we'll have to see so there's a lot of cool storylines with that matchup um again with Phoenix getting Kevin Durant healthy if the Clippers can ever make a run I don't know it seems like Kawhi and the Clippers haven't really been able to do anything since they made that team. The West just has a lot of storylines, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, And then, I mean, we can kind of look at the East too, but realistically, the East has kind of been the same. Yeah. Honest, I think Milwaukee is a lock for the finals, and I I don't see this version of Boston beating them this year. Mm -hmm. Philly, do you have any faith in Philly? No. I don't have any faith in Boston. Um, if you look really at, all your faith is gone in Boston, yeah, yeah. Look at their look at their games. They are so wildly inefficient. Like they're they're so confusing. They got blown out by the the Wizards the other night. 
they crushed the Spurs. They crushed the They Pacers. are all over the place on yeah. They they had a good three game streak. They lost a close one with the Jazz, but they just drop random games. Like they dropped yeah. one to the Rockets. Um they dropped oh the Cavaliers aren't too bad. I honestly I like Cleveland more than Philly. I like the Cavs more. That's with Philly having Joel Embiid. I I can't trust James Harden in the playoffs. Yeah, Tyrese Maxey is good and is probably going to have some really good games, but he's still too young. Tobias Harris, he's the luckiest man in the NBA. <laughs> People just don't care about him anymore. Yeah. He's making millions on millions. Mm-hmm. I'm honestly happy for him because, yeah. And then can we uh, just have a little quick discussion on the man that almost every playoff team still looks at as having value and has put up so many zeros in the regular season this year. P.J. Tucker. <laughs> I've never been on the P.J. Tucker He has wagon. more than any I've ever seen. This season he has at least like eight or nine just straight up zero, 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 zero games. We're di- Tony ca- Snow. Cardi- cardio games, basically. The Tony Snow yeah. special. The Tony Snow classic. The marathon. That's. I think P.J. Tucker is going to put up a few marathons in the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, I, what? I, mm. I don't I don't know. George Niang, are you a big George Niang fan? No, no. Exactly. Really. <laughs> no, I get I get your point. Um but I, I don't know. There's there's like certain parts of me that just think like if Joel Embiid and James Harden are playing at their best, like they can beat anybody, but I, I get what you're sp- saying, especially about uh James Harden like he just hasn't looked the same. Uh, with this Philly team, he's looked really good well, at times. He, he's had a really good regular season. Yeah, like he's he's full on like high high level point guard James Harden. Right, but I think they need him to go back to a little bit more of the scoring James Harden. I think just a little bit to. But then if you do that, doesn't that take away from Joel Embiid? I don't think so. I think it would take a, a take away from Tyrese Maxey maybe, but they can use Tyrese as more of a six man. That's just how I would do it. I'm not the coach. Who obviously. are you starting next to James Harden then? Let's, Anthony Melton and bring see. off Tyrese Maxey. I don't know. I just think that might be their best, their best, their best bet. We also really can't. That one lasted at least for a little while. Yeah. We also know we can't trust Doc Rivers that much as a playoff coach at this point because he's logged in the most chokes of any coach we've seen in our lifetime. Go back to starting uh, Cork Maz. Why not? Just stretch the floor. Are you trying to win a championship? <laughs> stretch the floor. I, I I don't know what you were, you're trying to do with the coach of the Sixers, Joey. That's uh, <laughs> everybody will go against you on that one. He's a fan favorite. But yeah, I, I just can't trust Philly. I can't do it. That's fair. I don't see anybody beating Milwaukee if they're fully healthy. Yeah, I mean, I kind of I kind of agree with you. Yeah, Giannis goes out and everybody steps up. Mm-hmm. Like Brooke Lopez, his transformation has been incredible from yeah. a post player to a three point shooter and defender. Bobby Portis always steps up when guys are out. Drew Holiday steps up his usage. Mm-hmm. Like uh they're they're the best team in the league. And I think Joe Ingles is getting healthier. He's had some good games. Um yeah. He hasn't played a lot because he had an early injury, but he uh he's getting there. I think the most impressive one is Javon Carter, though, for me. High quality backup. Just because, like, when Very he gets when backup. he gets minutes, he plays well. Um, and I never thought never thought he was going to really reach that point. So it's kind of cool. And then yeah. they did sign Myers Leonard. I don't know what his uh, status really is, but if he ever gets back to what he was, that could be something. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't like the East too much. Really? Can I jump back to the West really quick? Yep. I was going to go back there anyway. There's one team I'm more afraid of if I'm in the East than any. Mm-hmm. And a team, a team that I think could possibly make a run this year, especially since John Moran is back. If you watch Memphis recently, they're just – they're playing like a top two seed in the West. Like, I, they scare me more than Denver. Mm-hmm. I like Sacramento a lot, but they scare me more than Sacramento. Like, have you seen what Luke Kennard has been doing? Yeah. He's, like, not missing three. He hit ten threes a few games ago. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's like, not missing off the bench. Des Bain is doing what he does. Ja is back. Jaron Jackson has taken his game up since Ja was out. 
I mean, every, everybody on their team is just playing really good basketball. We neither of us. <laughs> this is man. This is a weird one. Neither of us really like Dylan Brooks, but he still plays his role, I guess, mm-hmm. as like a psychological pest. But I, I'm afraid of Memphis if I'm in the West. I could care less about Memphis. I've said it before. I just don't like them. Um. Do you, do, do you have basketball reasons? Because uh, it sounds like a, it, it, it sounds like like it doesn't have much to do with basketball. I mean, it's partially to do with basketball, but it's more so like... They're playing a great basketball right it, now. It's along the same lines of like, I feel like they're still too young maybe, um, but maybe that's not giving them enough credit. I don't know. But I, I just... I don't know. Do you feel like no team in the West is going to make a run? I if have, you could pick a team right now, could you pick one? No. I feel like <laughs> anybody could win the West. I, that's literally how I feel. I mean, it's weird. Like, the Grizzlies have two Michigan State guys in their backcourt or in their front court. Um, they lost Steven Adams, which I feel would be a good anchor for them. Um, going Honestly, into the when playoffs. it gets to the playoffs, I think Steven Adams kind of doesn't fit. I think he's, a lot he's, when they get into the playoffs. He's a better Xavier Tillman, I would think. I mean, he doesn't. He gives you one thing, and, and in the play, of, in the play, in a seven game series, you need more than right. a big that gives you one thing. And I think that's shown a few times. I like Stephen Adams. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I I just I don't. I'm I'm curious what's going to happen with their bench going into the playoffs because I think that's kind of their. Tyus Jones somewhat, is the best backup in the league. Somewhat weak point. Is it? I think so. I trust Santi Aldama. Do I you? trust Kanji. Yes. I trust Conchar. I don't know if I do. Every time Conchar comes in the game, he does he does he doesn't do anything wrong. He just plays defense and hits open shots. Like I mean look, I, every guy every guy they got they have off the bench, like one of my guys from the draft last year, David Roddy, mm-hmm. he's gotten better throughout the season. He might not be a huge impact guy in the playoffs, yeah. but everybody knows their role. Everybody knows what they're doing. Now, if my guy Luke Kennard can keep up what he's been doing, then that's they, another thing. Then that could be. Um, I don't. I don't know. Something I think about Memphis the is dangerous in the playoffs. I just. I don't know. I don't know. They would most likely. I mean, right now they're matched up against Minnesota, which, yes, I could see them taking down Minnesota just pick pretty the easily. Kings to win it all. Just do it. But like, <laughs> really, pick them to win the whole thing. Denver has. Options to win, I do, like, the Grizzlies are good. They have ways to get to the finals. The Kings actually have a way to the finals. The Suns, the Clippers. The Kings making a finals run after 17 years of no playoffs would be absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah. I think they would have to play the Clippers or the Timberwolves. I I don't think, as fun as the Golden State matchup would be because it's, you know, 90 minutes away from each other, I think Golden State would be able to to win that matchup. Um, and I hate to say the Lakers, you know, if they do make it and they're healthy, they unfortunately always have a chance. Um, but I, I don't know. Who who do you think, let's just do, what would be your, your Eastern Conference Finals and Western Conference Finals? And then who would play for the NBA Finals? Well, I I don't know how the matchups end end yeah. up like when you go through, but just because I like them the most, I'd say Milwaukee and and Cleveland, and then Milwaukee winning in like five or six games mm-hmm. in the West. Maybe just maybe Denver and Memphis. Hmm. Like I I've said, without Andrew Wiggins, I think the Warriors just aren't complete. Mm-hmm. I don't trust Michael Porter Jr. in the playoffs. I don't know what Jamal Murray's health is going to be. <sighs> yeah, the West is tough. <laughs> the West is tough. I'd love it if it was like Sacramento and Memphis. Mm-hmm. That'd be amazing. But I, I, I just go Denver, Memphis. I guess maybe. Like Phoenix is still supposed to be. They have Kevin Durant. Yeah. If KD is healthy, I'm actually I'm going to go. Memphis and Phoenix in the Western Conference Finals. <laughs> 
if KD is fully healthy. Yeah. Um, I think for my Eastern Conference, I would also have to go with Milwaukee. Who would they play though? Um, it could be Boston again. Even the, I mean, they Boston put Milwaukee out last year. Yeah, and then lost to Miami in the Eastern Conference Finals. My heart says New York, but I know they're not going to. Um, you a Knicks fan all of a sudden? I mean, I've liked the Knicks since at least like the last couple of years, and I thought I they were one of the teams that I predicted to do well this season. Um, yeah, I would probably go with the chalk there and just Milwaukee, Boston. I think there's a universe where Brooklyn upsets Philly. Maybe where Mikael Bridges averages like thirty something. He's mad that they and, didn't hold on to him after yeah, drafting him. He just averages like 30-something, and those guys just like take it out, all their frustration on Philly. Yeah. I don't know. This, um, these playoffs could get crazy. My Western Conference, I want, uh, like, I think Denver would be cool to see them finally break through to get it to the Western Conference Finals. I want to see Jokic in the Finals. Yeah. I'd like to see it. Mm-hmm. Um. I think my like fun matchup, my heart matchup would be Phoenix and Golden State. Um, that'd be a fun Western Conference Finals, of course. Um, but I think it's more likely to be Denver and Golden State, and I don't know if that actually ends up working out in in a bracket, but that would be my guess. And I don't know. I'm like back on the Golden State train where. I think it could be Golden State taking on Milwaukee in the finals. And call me crazy. I don't care. I just, I don't know. What is Steph Curry average in this scenario? That's my question. I mean, what is he what averaging is he on the season? He's averaging 29, 6, and 6 or something. Every superstar's numbers go up in the playoffs. So what is Steph Curry averaging with Andrew Wiggins out and him literally I mean, being God in the playoffs and getting them to the finals? He'd be averaging. Tell me, Joey. I don't know if he has to be that. I think it's more Clay Thompson. Without Andrew Wiggins. I think Clay Thompson has to step How do you, back up. It seems like you just don't like you. you the importance of Andrew Wiggins just doesn't mean something. No, to it you. does. I I get that that point. Like he was almost Finals MVP. Yes. Well, there there is a chance that if they make it through the first round, that he could be back for the playoffs. I don't know if he's coming back at all. There's been talks that they, they Listen, could bring him back. I, I, we're not going to go deep into the rumors of Andrew Wiggins, <laughs> yeah. but if it's true, his mind is going to be gone for for a for a little while. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. If he comes back in the playoffs, then I can get with you. Yeah. If Andrew is back and he's locked in, mm-hmm. they have a chance to do it again. But I, I, I don't know if he's going to be back. I just like, think. The, the Warriors themselves don't have a timetable on him. Mm-hmm. I just think they're, like, there's room for improvement for Clay. There's room for improvement for Jordan Poole. Um, At this point, I just don't think Kuminga can. I don't have much faith in him. I think Dante DiVincenzo is another. Uh... DiVincenzo has been a really quality six man. Yeah. I've liked him a lot. But I think yeah. he can step up his defense. If Gary Payton the second comes back. Um... That, yeah, that's a key part too. Is there, there are so many ifs. Yeah. I don't know. It's just the Warriors are starting to do it again. Where they're, I mean, maybe it's just because I watched the game last night and Steph Curry's incredible, but. Yeah. It, it, Steph, Steph is always going to. Yeah. I forgot he's 35 years old. Listen, we we both know his style of play can keep him playing at this level for a while. Yeah. But, and again, like, if they were able to win again this year. We got to have some conversations. Uh, Steph Curry. Some people are, <laughs> yeah. Some people are moving down a list. Yeah. Uh, big time, actually. He has four. He'd be on. He he'd have five. He'd be on the Mount Rushmore. Yeah, with five rings, Steph Curry takes a leap. Yeah, That's a big one. To me, jumping over Magic Johnson as greatest point guard is close to impossible. But Steph wins one more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to start having conversations. Um. So yeah, weird Warriors are that one team that never gets old for me for some reason. Um. Oh, what's what's your dream final scenario? Or what dream final want? scenario. Like, what would you want? And then maybe who do you think would actually make it? Milwaukee, Denver would be awesome. Giannis versus Jokic. Just the ones. 
the, the those that would be incredibly high level MVP top three candidates scoring playmaking like Drew Holiday versus Jamal Murray, mm-hmm. Chris Middleton versus Michael Porter. Like it, the storylines would be awesome in terms of high level basketball and two franchises that that aren't in these positions often. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sacramento, Cleveland. That's your just just out of fun. That's what you just out want. of just out of what is happening would be incredible. Mm-hmm. Sacramento, Cleveland. Yeah. Alrighty. I I just don't see a a way Embiid makes the finals. It's sad. Yeah. It's sad. <coughs> um, let's move over to the NFL then to kind of wrap things up. Um. Kind of the biggest news lately has been Lamar Jackson's trade request. Um, He said that he officially requested a trade at the beginning of the month, and it was just revealed basically last week. And it seems like nobody wants him. Uh, It is a very strange situation. Yeah, basically. One of the strangest. And a lot of the teams that were rumored to be in the running to get him have basically all fallen out. Detroit was one of them. Um, it seems like for the most part, they've talked their way out of that. Um, but it's kind of like, do you think it's like personal? Do you think it's one of those scenarios where people are, I, there are literally like six or seven areas you could go on this. There's the Lamar being his own agent thing Mm -hmm. where nobody understands like what's fully going on in these negotiations. There's Lamar speaking open publicly saying he wanted this and the Ravens wouldn't give it to him. But then the Ravens offered him something last year and he didn't take it. Mm -hmm. There's the fact it seems like no team wants to give him this guaranteed money that he wants. Then There's like the pro Lamar side where it's like every team should be willing to give this money to him because he's that high level of player, Mm -hmm. but he also hasn't produced in the playoffs and he has flaws. There's, there's so many, there are so many different aspects of this where I, I, I don't have one opinion on it. It's just mm-hmm. there's so there's too much. Yeah. There's too much to look at on in every side of this to where it, it seems like Lamar is not going to be a Raven again. But I, I just don't I don't know at this point. Like, are, is Baltimore really willing to just blow up everything they've built? Yeah. Because After they the, changed because, their entire offense to draft this guy. Are they really willing to blow it all up and potentially just start Tyler Huntley for a season? Which I think to make a point isn't like, Tyler I, Huntley still technically a free agent? Did he get honestly? One? I didn't even know. Like I think he might be. Oh, but um, yeah, I it it would be one of the weirdest situations ever if Baltimore was really willing to just throw all of this away. Yeah, this generational talent of a quarterback to just walk away and just give up. Mm-hmm. On your winning ways, yeah. kind of. I think because there's no plan but yeah. after Lamar, and that's the other weird thing too is why none of these other teams have really gotten involved. Because this guy's won an MVP. I know it's been that, three years, I, so I understand that. Yeah, and he's he's had some of his injury issues, but and I I guess I get too that you have to change your offense probably to bring him in, but like the talent is there, so that's the part that kind of surprises me when. You know, the Raiders are out there signing Jimmy Garoppolo and all these kind of subpar teams, I would say. And even now, like, the Falcons were a team that was rumored at the beginning of the offseason that they might take a stab. They just announced Desmond Ritter's going to be their starter. Yeah, they said they think Desmond's the guy. Um, So now, like, one of the top ones is Washington. Ew. (laughs) We don't even know what their ownership is going to be. Right. Exactly. There are people still bidding for that franchise. Yeah, and the, the, the money part for that one is weird, too. Yeah. And especially when they've been kind of saying that they like Sam Howell and how he's progressed. So it's just weird. It, it's weird. Part of me feels a little bit bad for Lamar, but it's hard to know, like, what's going on in the backside of it. Um, it's just a weird scenario to see uh, one of the best quarterbacks in the league not getting any interest from teams. Um, I, th- I think the thing that makes it the worst, though, is probably the Deshaun Watson contract. That kind of threw a wrench in that, everything. That's, that's just Cleveland, honestly. Yeah. That, that's one where you just chalk it up to Cleveland being Cleveland. 
Yeah. And, yeah, that's just a weird situation they put themselves in. Mm -hmm. All right. So the main thing we wanted to talk about with the NFL today was some of the top prospects for the NFL draft. We haven't really gotten into any of those because of March Madness and all that stuff. But the draft is, you know, it's coming up in a couple weeks. And so we figured we start doing some some prospect talk, talk about most of the top guys. This could be a draft where potentially four quarterbacks could go in the first. Some people are saying four quarterbacks in the first four picks if things, you know, get traded around and stuff like that, which would be wild. Um, we got Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, our favorite Will Le- Levis, <laughs> and Anthony <laughs> Richardson. Favorite. Uh, Anthony Richardson, who has blown up um, after all of his combine and athleticism showing out. Um, he's kind of gotten almost the Zach Wilson treatment where people are like enamored with him. Um, and then Bryce Young and CJ Stroud, kind of just the top two. And then Will Levis and Anthony Richardson being the the highlight real guys that big arm, super fast. Things like that, the athleticism. Well, how would you order those top quarterbacks? So, my top hasn't changed from the beginning to the college football season to the end. Mm-hmm. Bryce Young has been my guy. I think he's the best of what Russell Wilson is. His size is a concern that I understand. Yeah. He's 5'11" maybe 190 on a good day but he's the best co- I, he's the best quarterback mm-hmm. this was one of the only years Alabama didn't have like a top high level number one receiver everything was basically Bryce get it done and save us mm-hmm. and he almost got them to the playoff doing that they lost a few games because so much was on his shoulders but he still had a really good year yeah he's small but he's he has the accuracy. He has the arm. He makes playing the game look easy yeah. as a quarterback. Everything looks like it's in slow motion for him, and his reads are just all on time, and he he just understands the game at such an incredibly high level. Mm-hmm. C.J. Stroud, to me, he wasn't really close to Bryce Young until that Georgia game in the playoff. Mm-hmm. He showed some improvisational skills and maintained his accuracy and went toe-to-toe with Georgia. That was impressive. I still don't think he's a high-level improvisation guy. He's more of a pocket passer. Mm -hmm. But when you draw something up and he has time in the pocket, he's going to pick you apart. Yeah. He's a surgeon in there. And there's a lot of value in that. So he's the clear number two. Okay. The project guys. Number three. My number three is Anthony Richardson. Okay. I kind of figured. You mentioned Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson, to me, is more the hype and the wow. I compare Zach Wilson and Will Levis. Mm -hmm. The only wow with them two are some, like, crazy wow throws that you only see a few times a game and not, not throws that you see every game. Yeah. Anthony Richardson has a Cam Newton type like all time great ceiling. Mm-hmm. He's six four, two forty four, four four speed. When he runs in the open field, the speed shows and he's hard to bring down. Yeah. He has a cannon of an arm. There are in there are there are definitely inaccuracy issues. But when he is on point, it looks incredible. Mm -hmm. The last five games of the season was his best stretch. I think he threw like 12 touchdowns to four picks in the last five games. His ceiling is just on another level. I think Will Levis has a big arm, and I'm not impressed about much more than that. Like, he's athletic, Mm -hmm. but he's not going to break off like runs that are eye-popping like Anthony Richardson. Yeah. Anthony Richardson has just as big an arm, maybe bigger, and he can run at an extremely high level. Yeah. Do you think there's a chance, and then we'll get into the more of the skill players, do you think that there's a chance that Will Levis 
maybe not to the same degree, but could fall like Malik Willis did last year, where like there's all this hype around this guy, everybody loves him, and then nobody drafts him. Since the focus has gone more on Anthony Richardson, I think it's possible. But I really don't see him falling past the Raiders. There's just been something about Will Levis and the Las Vegas Raiders Mm -hmm. being paired together that just makes sense in my mind. Yeah. And they're in need of a future quarterback, most likely. Mm -hmm. So him sitting behind Jimmy Garoppolo would probably be their plan. Yeah, it, it would be hard for me to see him falling out of the top 10. Yeah. People are just, people are just so intrigued by him being six four two thirty five with his arm strength and his ability to make so many high level throws. But yeah, I Will Levis is fourth on the list for me. Yeah, Anthony Richardson's ceiling is the highest of any of the players. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think my order is probably the same. Um, I do think Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud are closer than I originally thought. Um, I did watch some of uh, C.J. Stroud's pro day where people kind of wowed from that too. Um, I think there is a chance that he could go before Bryce Young, um, but I think those two are the top for sure. Um, And I kind of agree with what you said about Anthony Richardson and Will Levis. Um, The defensive guys, because they're the other kind of the top, Jalen Carter and Will Anderson. We'll start with Will, or we'll start with Jalen Carter just because of the recent controversy. I think we talked about the, the legal issues last week a little bit, but during his pro day, it had shown that he had put on nine pounds. He didn't finish drills. So now there's question about character and blah, blah, blah. And then just yesterday, the lions got like an interview with him and Brad Holmes ended up saying that uh, a friend of Jalen Carter's had said something to them that was very interesting and then when the reporter asked, was it good or bad? He just said it was he interesting. He said it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, which I think is cool. It, it's it's nice to see that the the Lions are taking a sneaky approach to their draft. Um, but does the Jalen Carter stuff concern you at all? Or do you think that if he gets to six, the Lions should just take him? I think it is a concern. The fact that he would show up to his pro day just – I don't know where he is mentally – He's a young man. He's dealing with a lot of things, a lot of controversy, a lot of people throwing stuff on his name. So it's it's just a tough situation. Mm-hmm. I don't know why he showed up kind of overweight and just out of shape for the pro day. I don't know why. It could be because that setting just isn't a great display for his talents. Mm-hmm. It really seems like Jalen Carter is just a turn-on-the-tape kind of guy. Yeah. Like, you put him in pads and put him on that field, he just dominates. Mm -hmm. Because he's not much of a – he's also not much of a stats guy. Like, if you look at his stats, he's not like a big sack guy. He's he's just a gap filler. Yeah. He's he's a guy that makes it easier for everybody else on the line. Right. So, he's hard to to kind of lock down into where he would fit. He he scares O-lines. Right. I think – If he fell to the Lions at six, it would be hard to not take him. Mm -hmm. Just because you turn on the tape and you see what it is. Yeah. You know exactly what it is. The questions about character are real, and the pro day concerns are real. But if Brad Holmes talked to him, and he has good feelings that this guy will come in and be dedicated to the the Lions, Mm -hmm. then you take him. Yeah. Because he's like the second or third most talented player in this draft. Yes. Behind Will Levis. I mean, behind um, Will, Will Anderson. Anderson. Yep. So, yes, it would be hard to pass on him at six. Mm-hmm. And not knowing what Brad Holmes knows, I think I'd probably take him. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Will Anderson, I think we are both in probably the same step that if Will Anderson fell to us at six, yeah. we're running up to the podium. Yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's not a question. Yeah. It is a parade in the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh Will Anderson just he's got everything. Um yeah, he's I think he's that freaky athletic pass rusher. To that have gives you almost everything. To have Will Anderson and Aiden Hutchinson in back to back drafts would be incredible. Especially for yeah. the Lions to get Will Anderson at six when he is projected. Now there are scenarios the Lions could trade up. We'll maybe talk about those sure. maybe next week. We can talk about more Lions specific uh scenarios. Um but Will Anderson I think is the clear cut 
best defensive player in this draft. Um, then we have the cornerbacks. Uh, oh, I should mention Tyree Wilson because he's also kind of been moving up that some people um, would take over a uh, Jalen Carter. Another big edge rusher, 6'6", 271. Um, I think he's also a very good talent. Um, the cornerbacks have kind of been rumored a bit. Um, Christian Gonzalez, kind of the, I would say the top prospect for cornerbacks, um, just big athletic, uh, he, he's the one that had the 40 inch vertical, right? I believe. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, he had a really good pro day. He's very athletic, mm -hmm. but. If we're talking about the Lions and corners, I think they filled everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe you take one. I, I don't think taking one in the first round is a good choice. Maybe you take one later that you really like yeah. that's kind of falling. But, yeah, there, there's no reason for the Lions to take corner in the first round now. Right. They they figured everything out in free agency. Mm -hmm. But somebody could get a very good corner up in the top. I, I think he's still a top ten for somebody. Um, and then the other kind of, like, top prospect that I wanted to talk about is is uh, Peter Skaronsky. He's kind of been also kind of moving up draft boards as Jalen Carter has been falling. Um, it seems like he'd be a good backup option for a lot of teams. Um, it's nice to see a Northwestern player up at the top. Yeah, they had Rashawn Slater came out of Northwestern right, too. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so we've been seeing Northwestern getting some, uh, some offensive line guys, uh, which is cool to see. Um, but yeah, those are some of the top prospects. Like I said, we just do a quick overview today. Hopefully next week, like I said, uh, we'll go over the March Madness will be over. So we'll go over the Final Four and the finals. Give any more NBA updates because we will have a more clear picture by next week. Um, there will only be like one or two games left of the NBA season actually um, at that point. And then we'll probably go more into NFL draft talk. Like I said, we'll probably talk more um, – Lions prospects, and we'll get into some of the skill players, what like the wide receivers, the running backs, yeah. uh, things like that. Um, maybe some sneaky guys, like I mean, he's not really sneaky, but Nolan Smith. Um, but yeah, we'll get into that next week. Hopefully, we'll have some of these uh audio issues figured out, but uh, no promises, I guess. Um, but this has been views from the sidelines, and we will see you guys next week Aztecs make me proud even though I didn't fully believe in you get it done <laughs>